coming up across July and uh, hopefully uh, later in the year, we have Russell Morris, The Real Thing, and 65 people up on stage. I don't know if that includes you, Russell. There's 65 on stage plus you, 56 in the orchestra, the band, you. That's a lot of people Maybe on stage. It is a lot of people and it's... Um... It will be incredibly exciting. It'll be almost like being strapped to the front of an express train because once it starts, you can't stop it. And people say to me, oh, it'll be wonderful if you've got any nerves. I say, yes, I have got nerves because when I'm on stage with my band, there's only four of us, if I make a mistake, which I did the other night, we we worked somewhere and I started Rachel and I started the second verse first, which is a train wreck because the chords are completely different. <laughs> so the band can adjust. If I do that with an orchestra, it's almost like you're trying to jump back into the water after the Queen Mary has left the dock and swimming to try and catch up because you can't catch up. So that's my only fear, not the fear of uh, the songs, but the fear of uh, stepping on something that's quite nasty. <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess, you know, the, the normal thing when people come along to one of your shows, somebody can yell out from the audience and on the fly you can perform the song if you choose. You can't do that with an orchestra. No, you can't. And once yeah, once they've started, it's like a, a, a train that can't be turned around. So you have to make sure you're in your compartment sitting in your seat and stay in that seat. Don't go getting up and wandering around and waving out the window to people because if you do that, you're in trouble. So I've got to make sure that I'm, I've got my head screwed on, which usually isn't. I can get very distracted very easily. Coming up, the Sydney Opera House on the 2nd of July and Hamer Hall on the 4th of July. Now, these are two iconic uh, and historic venues in Australia. Um, have you performed in either of them or both of them before? I've performed in both of them, but only with other people, you know, in, in big shows. Um, and uh, it, it's really a beautiful atmosphere to be in. I, I really like both of them. And how iconic is uh, the Opera House anyway? You know, it's world famous. And uh, that uh, building, which was uh, an ugly duckling, so everyone called it when it first, as one of the objects of architectural beauty throughout the world now. And, and everyone acknowledges that. So that, that's, a, that's, that's fabulous. How is the sound for you then when you're performing Ooh. in the Opera House or Hamer Hall? Because Hamer Hall, uh, for those who don't know, uh, outside Melbourne, is six floors under St Kilda Road in Melbourne. So the it's just a dead sound in there, isn't it? It's just a beautiful sound with no interruption. And the Sydney Opera House and the acoustics is superb as well. What difference does that make to your song when you're performing as uh, opposed to being in a, a loud uh, club or pub? Well, the difference what it, what it does is that um, everyone in the band can hear clearly. Although we've got in ears, so that that'll cut out anything else. But it's also it's a better um, experience for the audience because nothing is leaking or bouncing around sound wise. There's nothing worse than say, for instance, uh, last week we were, we worked at that's my dog. Uh, <laughs> oh. He's producing at your end. I've got Winston uh, yeah. producing at my end. You've yeah. got yours. He's yours. not doing any barking though. <laughs> um, and it's uh, we played at a, a club, and it was glass windows, and the frequencies of electric guitars and drums bounce off the glass windows like nobody's business, and they become an absolute nightmare for the audience as well, and it becomes a bit messy. That's the great thing about these big auditoriums that are being designed for sound. The sound isn't shouldn't be messy. If it is, start blaming the sound mixer or start blaming the band. Yeah, and uh, putting an orchestra together uh, at a show like this is incredibly expensive. Um, others have done it in the past. Uh, it's taken a long time for you to get to this point, and you've got there through an unusual source, haven't you? Somebody who we uh, would least expect to be. Uh, a music fan as he's turned out to be. And I'm talking about Clive Palmer here. Um, that's a, a, a very interesting person to uh, find that, you know, he he has made this possible for you. Yes. Well, um, like in the schoolyard, which used to happen to me at school as well, 
when you're standing and, you know, there's got two captains out there and they say, I'll take Bobby, I'll take John, I'll take that. And you're the last one standing with your hand up going, me, please me. And, and, and you're taken by default at the end. And that's what happened. I tried to get any of the orchestras interested in doing any of my shows. We tried a, a number of times, spoken to, to liaisons and things like that. No one was interested. So I'd given up on it. And I was doing a show and sitting in the audience was Clive Palmer, which did the show, didn't worry, finished, got off, went out to sell CDs and he was in the line with three CDs. And he bought the CDs and said to me, uh, I've always been a fan since I was at school. He said, I love, I love your stuff. And uh, he said, I don't think you've had the right breaks somehow. He said, I just feel that some things could have gone a little bit better. And I said, well, hey, I'm doing really well. I'm very happy. He said, yes, I understand that. He said, but I think you could take another step. And didn't say any more. That was it. He left. And um, months later, I was working in Townsville, and the lady said, oh, you've got two shows, one tonight and one tomorrow night. Clive Palmer's booked three tables each night. I said, wow. So I got up on stage and started sending him up, saying things <laughs> like, uh, I've driven past your place in my boat, and I've got a tin in because I've got a tin in. I've waved, and you pull all the blinds down. What's wrong with you? All, you're supposed to be a neighbour, all that sort of stuff. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like, to, I'd like to leave you with some great Australian words of wisdom. From a great Australian, Mr. Clive Palmer, thanks for your company. <laughs> and he thought that was really funny. So he came back and said, will you have lunch with me? So I went and had lunch with my wife and we, he sat there and he said, I, <clears throat> I want to finance a show. And I said, what do you mean? Where? I said, I'm, do I'm doing on my show. He said, no, I want you to do the opera house and I want you to do Hamer. And I said, I can't do that. And he said, why? I said, I do 200 seat, 400 seater shows. And sometimes I don't fill them out. You know, I do big festivals, but there's other people on. And he said, oh, you're selling yourself short. He said, I believe you can. And I said, listen, I don't think, he said, I want you on there with a 60 piece orchestra and I want you to do this. And I said, oh, let me think about it. I thought about it and ran into he had a party and I went there and I ran into a lot of the people at the party. Started talking to them, what do you do? Oh, I went to school with Clive. Well, you're still mates. Oh, yeah, he's been, he said, there's about 15 of us here. We're all, we've all been mates ever, forever. And I said, what do you do? He said, I'm a sculptor. He said, I sculpt people's hands when they get married and things like that. So, okay. Another guy I met and they all, and I thought, gee, he evokes a lot of loyalty. So I thought about it and I said, okay, let's try it. I said, but I think we can't talk politics and I think we can't, um, you're going to lose a lot of money. I said, because I don't, I think we'll have to paper it and it's going to be embarrassing for me if we have to give away 300 seats to each show. And he said, I think you're wrong. He said, but I don't care if I have to lose the money, I lose the money because I want to, he said, I really believe I want to do this. And he did. And uh to give him credit, he was he was right. We sold out in three days in Melbourne and now Sydney sold out. So it's, yeah, it's been great. What about David Hirschfelder? How did David come to be a part of all of this? Well, David Hirschfelder, I've always admired. He is such a superstar, incredible brain, wonderful arranger. And I've known him for a long time. I remember Deb, his wife, rang up at one stage and said, would you guys play at uh, our son's school, <coughs> Trinity, at the fest at the dinner night. And we said, yeah, yeah, we'll do it. So I told the boys, and one of the boys said, oh, do you think David would play a song with us? I said, all right. So I rang back and I said, Deb, do you think David would play one song with us? She said, oh, of course he will. He'd love to. I said, no, you better ask David. She said, no, he'd be champing at the bit. He wants to do it. So we get there to set up. David's already set up all his keyboards. So we go, wow. And he's waiting there. We plug in and we get everything going. I said, well, David, what couple of songs do you want to play with us? And he said, oh, I'll, I'll play the whole night. I said, but you don't know the songs. He said, oh, I'll, be, I'll be all right. He played the whole night. None of us heard him make a mistake. Wow. That's how great he is. His ear is incredible. And uh, I've always loved him. And when it came up and Clive said, who are you going to, what do you, who do you want to arrange it? And I said, no one else but David Hirschfelder because mm. he's got the sentiment of rock. He loves rock and he also loves classical. It's it's a very hard mix. Sometimes you, you've, you've got to get 
particularly with orchestras, people who have played rock and are used to it. And David's very good at putting that together. And we've got a, a wonderful uh, conductor, Peter Morris, and we've got stage directors and all that stuff that I could never afford, never in my wildest dreams. Let's talk about uh, a few songs that are going to be in here. Now, we're not going to give away the whole plot. People can come and see the show and uh, see how the story ends. We won't get to that bit. Um, but first off, uh, we'll talk about five songs that we we know will be in the show because uh, all of the publicity is telling us there. In fact, Russell Morris, The Real Thing, sort of is a giveaway that The Real Thing is going to be part of this. How much bigger will that song be? I mean, it was already <laughs> gigantic, wasn't it, on the on the original recording uh, produced by Molly with all of those sounds around it. So how much further can you expand that with an orchestra? Well, David's done a couple of things that at first I thought, do I like this? This is different. And I thought, no, let's do it. And he's put a couple of surprises in the end there that people will pick up on. Um, and it's just it just it's just the real thing again, but with a with a huge orchestra, which it never had. So the orchestra is playing very different parts. And uh it's very strange if I sit down with the because David's done all the arrangements on his computers. And if I sit down with that without the band and try and sing along, it's quite difficult because the way he has strings crossing across the beat. So you can't really hear the bump, 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 bump. But the way he's inter interlaced the melodies of the strings and things like that is is quite incredible, particularly in in some of the other songs. It's like, wow, how do you do that? And so I've got to make sure I, I count it and count it and count it because when the band comes in, it should be second nature to me. So, but I want to get to know it just with those arrangements without drums or guitars or anything. Sweet, sweet love could be just you and an acoustic guitar. I mean, that's going to sound magic with 65 people surrounding it. Oh, it will be. And we've got some wonderful singers as well. So that that should be absolutely great. And uh, all the harmonies and that will be massive. You know, I think we've got uh, four singers, but two in the band sing beautifully as well. So it's like six wonderful singers. So that's yeah. great. And uh, Clive wanted a choir, and I said, I'm not having a choir. They sound too gospely. I don't want it. I said, no choirs. I want it to be a little bit rock and roll. And Wings of an Eagle, I'm, I'm sure that would fit a similar pattern. <laughs> yeah, that fits into the pattern. But funnily enough, in the band we've been doing for ages, and Johnny Creech, our drummer, is uh, is obsessed with harmonies. So he puts harmonies in everything. You know, he puts harmonies over the counting. One, two, three, four. So one, two, three, that's almost like that. So he's put harmonies in songs that never had harmony. And I said to him one day, I said, John, you know Wings of an Eagle doesn't have any harmonies? He said, yes, it does. I said, it doesn't. Go and listen to the record. I said, there are none, not one harmony. He said, oh, but it sounds better with harmonies, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to have to stand on him at, on on different points and say no harmony, John. No, back off. Mm, yeah. Well, you talk about uh, you know the big rock song "Hush," uh, which was a cover back in the day. Um, that that was a Joe South song, wasn't it? That's right. The wonderful that, Joe South. What a great deep, writer. Deep Purple then had the uh, yep. a hit with it in Australia. So where'd you pick up on that song via the Joe South <laughs> or via the Deep Purple version? No, well before Deep Purple, we did it before them. We picked up on the Billy Joe Royal version. Mm -hmm. Billy Joe Royal did it, and we picked up on that version and did that song. Mm. And uh, I loved the song. The moment I heard it, I thought, gee, this is a good song, a great song. And uh, incidentally, which is really odd, songs that uh, have worked for me and go really well, that's one of them, is the same chord structure. It's all in fourths, which is really bizarre. So, and it's really pleasing to the Western era and ear. And once I heard that, it, it grabbed me. And I think that's what must have been that, those chord progressions. So I really like that song. Um, and that is that's one of the most difficult ones to sing without a band, mm -hmm. because Dave's arrangements are like right out there, right out there. The the his his one seems to start on three of the that, the bar before. So if you listen to that, you get out of time. 
But this is where an orchestra really excels, isn't it? When you take a rock song and then you turn the orchestra into a rock band, yeah. that, that's when an orchestra explodes. Yeah, it's, well, we hope so. We hope it doesn't explode, it, literally. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it is going to be fun. There will be surprises in this show, and we're going to uh, alert people to one of the surprises here. A song that you have never done live before is going to be part of the orchestra shows. Tell us about that song, Russell. Well, I, I've i never done it because I've never really been a big fan of it. Um, and uh, Clive Palmer said, I want to hear that song. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. You know, it's just one of those things. I don't like the song and I won't do it. And he said, oh, I'd be very, that's disappointing. He said, I'd just love to see it. You know, I said, well, it's just like, us sitting and talking politics. I can't, I can't see that. I don't want to do it. He said, okay. So I spoke to a mutual friend of ours, Froggy in Canberra, and he said, that is incredibly rude. He said, you sh that he said, that is really not very polite. He said, here's a guy paying for you to do this and you won't do one song <laughs> just for him. And I went, gee, Frog, you're <laughs> right. So that's the song that uh, is being included. And that song is "It's Only a as Matter a of Time." To, yeah, it's only a matter of time. It's a tribute to um, Clive. Yeah, for doing it. I I cannot believe you've never performed that song live before. Never, never done it. Because that was a that was a hit song in Australia, seven inch single hit song, played all over the radio. You were the biggest uh, star of, uh, of of live music in Australia at the time, going around the country and leaving that out of your set list. Didn't, well, didn't I, the audience I, even yell it out at that point? Oh, yeah, I used to get annoyed uh, annoyed by people. They used to yell at me about it. But the thing was is um, if if you look back at my history, I tend to, in every now and then it's like you go, go, go out dressed up back in the 70s. People take a photo of you and you see it and you go, oh, my God, what was I thinking? Why would I even wear that stuff? And I tend to do that with some of my songs. I'll look back and go, why did I record that? It is so poppy and so schmaltzy. I won't do it. And that's why I've never done that. I've never done Girl That I Love, really. I've, I did it for a while, but I've, I've dropped a lot of those songs. But for this show, I'm bringing a lot of stuff back that I've never done for a long, long time. Live With Friends, I think, is one I've never heard you do, even though you go out with Brian Catt, who wrote the song all the time. Yeah, we do that now and then. And not now my then. band. With Ryan, I'll do it with Brian, yeah. Mm. But it's it's a bit of a rarity as well. It is, yeah. That's probably a rarity, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so the show's on July 2 and July 4, Sydney and Melbourne, and hopefully more later in the year, Russell? Yes, uh, depending on what happens. Uh, we would uh, tentatively, because they'd sold so fast, the promoter said got to go again and I said well can't keep doing it and he said well we haven't been to Adelaide and we haven't been to Brisbane and Melbourne sold out so fast you may be able to do another show so he's going to test the waters hmm. see what happens okay well we're looking forward to it Russell Morris uh, and orchestra do I have to wear a tuxedo or do you uh no I'm not going to wear a tuxedo but uh, we've been terrorizing Johnny Creech telling him that because he, he's not playing drums, we've got Jerry Pantazas playing drums, Johnny's singing with the other three, and we've been terrorising him, telling him that he has to wear a tux and he has to do dance steps. <laughs> and he had a, had a rehearsal yesterday and they said, one of the guys said, oh, John, have you learnt those steps yet? And John was horrified. <laughs> I'll be very disappointed if Johnny turns up and he's not wearing a top hat and a, a carrying <laughs> a cane. <laughs> <laughs> would suit him he's so damn yeah. absolutely looking forward to it thanks russell okay mate and uh i'll see you soon <laughs>